Welcome back. Okay, and let's have a deeper look into who exactly was Saint Martin of Tours. He was a 4th century saint, a Roman soldier who was baptized as an adult and became a monk. He was the Bishop of Tours, and he's the most familiar and recognizable Christian saint in the Western tradition. The legend of St. Martin says he was born in Pannonia in either 316 or 336, a Roman province over present-day Hungary. He served in the Roman cavalry in Gaul. In 361, he left his military service and embraced Trinitarianism, the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He became a disciple of Hilarius of Portier. known as the Hammer of the Arians, and the Arians followed the non-Trinitarian doctrine, Jesus as the Son of God, the Father, a creature distinct from the Father and therefore subordinate to him, but the Son is a God also. He reluctantly became Bishop of Tours in 371, He's best known for his account of his using his military sword to cut his cloak in two to give to a beggar. One day, as he was approaching the gates of the city of Amiens, he met a scantily clad beggar and impulsively cut his military cloak in half, to share with the man. That night, Martin dreamed of Jesus wearing the half-cloak he had given away. He heard Jesus say to the angels, Martin, who is still but a catechumen, clothed me with, his, with this robe. The dream confirmed Martin in his piety, and he was baptized at the age of eighteen. It's his most famous iconography, the sharing of the cloak. Martin's half cloak became the famous relic preserved in the oratory of the Merovingian kings. The kings of the Franks. This is King Clovis. He was the second king of the Merovingian dynasty, and he united the Franks in Gaul, and is regarded as the founder of France. Um, during the Middle Ages, the relic of Saint Martin's cloak the Kappa Sancti Martini, was carried by the king into battle and used as a holy relic upon which oaths were sworn. Here he is marrying um, Clotilda. And, well, first of all, Clovis was a pagan Germanic chieftain. His wife Clotilda tried to convince him of the truth of the faith. On the verge of losing a battle, like Constantine, he vowed to be baptized if he were victorious. He was, yet he didn't get baptized for another seven years. It was only after arriving at Tours on St. Martin's Day, 1111, where he was influenced by the pilgrims and the cures he witnessed. He decided to be baptized on Christmas Day. Here he is getting baptized. This is just cartoon history, in my opinion. Here's Clotilda praying at the tomb of St. Martin. She's credited with bringing Christianity to the Western world. There 
eyes. Martin sharing his half cloak. So the relic of the cloak was carried by the kings into battle. The cloak needed to be housed on the go. So small temporary sacred structures were built to house it. And they came to be known as capellas or little cloaks. The priest who cared for the cloak was called a capellanu, and ultimately all priests who served the military were called capellani. The French uh, translation is chaplain, from which the word chaplain is derived. The small temporary churches built for the relic were called capella, the word for little cloak or cape. Eventually, all small churches began to be referred as chapels. This is a depiction of the bishop Venantius Fortunatus, a Latin poet in the Merovingian court. On the medieval popularity of St. Martin, this bishop declared, Wherever Christ is known, Martin is honored. St. Martin's Day, also known as Martin Mass or Old Halloween, the St. Martin's Day feast is celebrated on November 11th. In the Middle Ages, much of Western Europe and Great Britain engaged in a 40-day period of fasting beginning, beginning on the day following Martin Mass. It's called the Quadragesima Sancti, Sancti Martini, the 40 days fast of St. Martin. This fasting time was later called Advent by the Church and considered a time for spiritual preparation for Christmas. This is a painting by Peter Brugel the Elder called The Wine of St. Martin's Day. Much revelry. Here's St. Martin cutting his cloak for the beggar. It's a harvest festival including the drinking of newly produced wine and the butchering of animals. There's an old English saying, his Martin Mass will come as it does to every hog. It's a blend of American Thanksgiving, Halloween, and a mini carnival pre-Advent. Traditionally, Martin Mass celebrates celebrations begin at the 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Bonfires are built and children carry lanterns after dark through the streets and sing songs in exchange for candy. So it got me wondering about the etymology of Free Martin. So what is a Free Martin? Well, Free Martins were first mentioned by the Roman writer Varro, who died in the in year 28 AD. He called them Taura. A free Martin is an infertile female mammal with masculinized behavior and non-functioning ovaries. The animal originates as a female, but acquires the male XY component in utero by exchange of some cellular material from a male twin via vascular connections between placentas. Externally, the animal appears female, but various aspects of female reproductive development are altered due to the acquisition of the antimullarian hormone from the male twin. Maybe that's where we get the word mule. Didn't say much about the etymology. Speculations include that free may indicate willing, referring to the free Martin's willingness to work. Martin is generally held to derive from an Irish 
or Gaelic word for cow or heifer, although connections to Martin Mass have also been posited. Skipping down to fictional use of free Martins, Aldous Huxley, in his novel The Brave New World, a free Martin, mentioned in chapters 1, 3, 11, and 17, is a woman who has been deliberately made sterile by exposure to hormones during fetal development. In the book, government policy requires free Martins to compose 70% of the female population. So I would say this is very much a blueprint of what's happening today. We are being overrun with free martins. Robert Heinlein also mentions free martins in his books. And there are a couple more allusions to it. But we're going to have a look at Nicola Griffith's novel, Hild, the title character sometimes referred to by others as a free martin, in reference to her non-feminine character and social role. This is Nicola Griffith. She's a British-American novelist, science fiction and fantasy LGBT genre writer, and she lives in Seattle. This is her novel, Hild. It was published in 2013 about the life of St. Hilda of Whitby, who was a significant figure in 7th century Britain. She is the founding abbess of the Monastery of Whitby in, where is that, North Yorkshire. And this monastery held the Synod of Whitby in 664. She was instrumental in the conversion of Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. There's North Yorkshire, there's the Whitby Monastery. All that we know about St. Hilda comes from the ecclesiastical history of the English people by the Venerable Bede in 731. Her feast day is 17th of November. She became a nun at the age of 33, and legend tells of a plague of snakes that she turned to stone, explaining the presence of ammonite fossils on Whidbey's shore, called snake stones. And here they are. Wherever you see St. Hilda, there are the ammonite fossils. Ammonites are an extinct group of encephalopods, the mollusk group that contains octopuses, vampire squids, nautiluses, and cuttlefish. The name was given by the Roman natural philosopher Pliny the Elder because they reminded him of the horns of Amun. These are the horns of Amun. It's just the Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence. The, uh, we all have horns of Amun in our brain called the Cornu Amunus or the Hippocampus. They are elongated ridges thought to be the center of emotion, memory, and the autonomic nervous system. Hippocampus in Greek, hippo means horse, and campus is sea monster. It's the seahorse. This is the College of St. Hilda and St. Bede in Durham, UK. named after a free martin. This is their coat of arms with the ammonite. 
And this is the College of St. Hilda, Oxford. And this is their coat of arms with the snake stone. So Nicola Griffith has a blog, asked Nicola, and she went into the um, etymology of Freet Martins a little more deeply. She found a passage in the Journal of Agricultural Research from 75 years ago, and we're going to look at that passage. The Freet Martin has been known to cattle breeders since before the establishment of the Roman Empire. The sterile cow born twin with a bull was referred to by Varro. It was called Taura, which apparently meant barren cow. Although the condition has been recognized for some 2,000 years, the origin of the term free martin is obscure. According to one authority, the word free meant willing or ready to go, as the free martin was supposed to be an especially willing worker. Now, as an aside here, she later explains that free martins were often kept by farmers to tell when their cows became um, in season because a free martin will mount a cow in estrus. And that could be the willing or ready to go aspect of the free martin. It has been proposed also that the word free was used to signify exemption from reproductive reproduction, sterile. Another authority saw in the term a contraction of the words fairy, pharaoh, or faro, which appear to be associated with the Flemish varvico, a cow that gives no milk, and the West Flemish vareco, a cow that has ceased to produce, ceased to be capable of producing offspring. It is not difficult to imagine association between the two words free and faro. There has probably been greater, greater speculation about the word Martin. It may have been derived from the Irish or Gaelic Mart, meaning heifer or cow. Efforts have been made to trace it to St. Martin, who, according to legend, once cast the devil from a cow. Moreover, St. Martin is said to have been the patron saint of twins, and unusual fecundity. Another explanation offered is that on or near November 11th, which is called Martin Mass Day in Scotland and England. It was customary to slaughter cattle, the meat of which was salted for winter and for winter use and called Martin Mass beef. An early English dictionary referred to Martin as not a true heifer, but an undeveloped male with many of the characteristics of the ox, generally fattened and killed about Martin Mass. It has been suggested further that the free martin may have been given the designation because its meat was so choice that it was reserved for St. Martin's, a great feast day. Moreover, the words mart, mert, mert, mert appear to have been used in Scotland and parts of England in referring to the cow or ox fattened for slaughter and salted or smoked for winter use. Hart show that, shows that it is not difficult, in view of these facts, to imagine such an individual being referred to as the Pharaoh Mart one, or in Scotland as the Pharaoh Martian, either of which might have been corrupted or shortened into Free Martin. So, I would put forth that this iconic image of Saint Martin is Martin sharing his genetic material with the barren female in utero? It could be just a symbol of the knowledge of gen um, in utero genetic manipulation. El Greco. over and over and over again. The horse is a universal symbol of virility. So you have the virile bull and the sterile free martin.
So, Free Martin syndrome is a set of twins, one male and one sterile female. It's an infertile female mammal with masculinized behavior and the non functioning ovaries. Genetically, the animal is chimeric, containing tissue with two or more genetically distinct populations of cells, or an individual derived from two or more zygotes. This is the chimera of Greek myth, literally means a she-goat, a fire-breathing hybrid creature composed of the parts of more than one animal. Free martins develop when vascular connections from between the placenta form between the placenta of the developing fetuses. The male fetus shares his hormones with the female calf, causing its reproductive tract to become more masculine. She is made sterile by exposure to the male hormones. Karyotyping of the sample of cells shows the XXXY chromosomes. So I clicked on what karyotyping was, and this is a karyotype of human chromosomes. And the first thing I thought when I saw this was look at all those 11s. This is a male. This is a human female. The chromosomes are really just a bunch of 11s. There are 22 autosomes, pairs of autosomes, and one pair of allosomes, or the sex chromosomes. This is a karyotype picture of a man with Klinefelter syndrome, XXY syndrome, when a male has two or more X chromosomes. The, um, in the male, it results in infertility and small testicles. Eleven, eleven. At about the fortieth day of pregnancy, the fluids of the two fetuses begin to mix, causing exchanges of blood and antigens that are unique to heifers and bulls. When the antigens mix, it causes them to develop characteristics of both sexes. This fortieth day of pregnancy reminded me of the forty-day fast of Saint Martin Mass, and. Forty days after St. Martin Mass leads up to the winter solstice. So I'm wondering if Martin is sharing his genetic material with Christ on the cross. Is Christ being portrayed as a free Martin? Well, there is a history of Jesus being a twin in the Gnostic tradition from the Gospel of St. Thomas, which is um, from the Nag Hammadi Library. In the Syriac speaking language of Upper Mesopotamia, in Syria, the apostle was called Judas Thomas. Thomas Talma means twin in Syriac, a form of Aramaic which was the language of Jesus and his followers. And Didymus, a name by which the apostle is also called in the Gospel of John, means twin in Greek. Perhaps some regarded the two as blood brothers. Perhaps the twinship was regarded as spiritual or symbolic. Sometimes in the Christian Gnostic systems, Thomas seems to be the this-worldly reflection or image of a divine savior figure, an earthly body inhabited by a spirit like the saviors. In any event, Thomas became a focus of special reverence. Here is Talma in Aramaic. Tav, Aleph, which is a pictograph of an ox. Vav, Mem, Aleph, 
Tau Ma and Didymus in Greek also means twin. Saint Martin also came to be regarded as a French Republican patron, even though he was a conscientious objector. He was the patron saint of soldiers. The name Martin comes from the Latin Martinus, which is derived from the Roman god Mars, the protective godhead of the Latins. In 1870, Tours became the capital of France during the Franco-Prussian War. Martin was promoted as a military saint, and numerous pilgrims visited his tomb. Here is his tomb in the Basilica of St. Martin, Tours. He was also associated with the nationalistic devotion to the Sacred Heart. And devotion to the Sacred Heart is one of the most widely practiced Roman Catholic devotions, taking Jesus Christ's physical heart as a representation of his divine love for humanity. Very graphic. The um, flag of the Sacre Coeur was born by the Pontifical Zouaves. We'll have a look at them in a second. And the banner read, Heart of Jesus, Save France. And on the reverse it said, Saint Martin, Protect France. This flag was placed in Martin's tomb overnight before the Battle of Pate. And Martin's cloak was actually considered the first flag of France. These are the papal Zouaves. They were an infantry force formed in defense of the papal states during the war for Italian independence. The original Zouaves were a Berber tribe from North Africa, and when France conquer conquered Algiers in 1830, the local units were officially integrated into the French army as elite units. This is zigzag rolling papers, and their logo features a Zouave. Zouaves became so popular, they even had uniforms in the American Civil War. Here are some Zouaves participating in the early part of World War I. Armistice Day was signed on St. Martin's Day, 11-11-1918. So you have 11-11-9-9. Could be a bunch of free Martins in that war. We have the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day of 1918 coming up in a few weeks. Here's some footage from 100 years ago to, of that day.
Here's a memorial in Anthem, Arizona, in the States. And at the eleventh minute of the eleventh hour, of the eleventh day of the eleventh month, the sun shines through this memorial and casts a picture of the Great Seal of America. Martin Luther was actually named after St. Martin. And check out Blue Heron Truth Seekers' Transvestigation of St. Martin. It's very interesting. Ironically, guess who the father of the Protestant Reformation was named after? Martin Luther was baptized on November 11th, 1483, another 11, and was named after none other than St. Martin of Tours. I believe a Martin Luther King could be another free Martin. Here is a, another free Martin image I found. This is Martin Shkreli, a hedge fund manager and biotech CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals. He was convicted of securities fraud and sentenced to seven years in prison with a $7.4 million fine, which is another 11. And he looks like a tranny to me. Here's another interesting image I found. I couldn't get any more information because I'm, I wasn't a donor. But they capped it at 1111. Free Martin. So, in a few weeks, when 1111 comes up, and the global mega ritual of everybody <laughs> holding silence at the 11th hour, pause to remember who are they really honoring. Happy St. Martin Mass.